So I'm sure everyone has seen a version of this picture at some point in their life. And it's, the purpose is really to show you like us human beings, we think the world revolves around us. And in reality, we're just a very small speck in a huge universe, right? And so one way you can look at this picture is, wow, God is amazing. He created all of this, right? And even, even though I am so small compared to all of this, you know, God still became man and died for me and my sins, right? Um, the wrong way to look at this picture is saying the universe is this large. I'm just one very small piece of dust in this whole picture. My life doesn't matter, right? And my contribution to the universe doesn't matter. That's the wrong way of looking at it. And I don't think that's how you should look at this picture at all. And this goes back to what Mina Salib was saying. If you have an idea that your contribution is insignificant, I'm gonna, I wanna challenge that thought um, because it doesn't really have a biblical basis at all. Um, and it can do you a lot more harm than, than good. And so to prove that, and, or so, so I, I give you like a theory. My theory is that uh, we should reject this idea that con your contribution is insignificant. So uh, let's look at a few examples where um, that support that idea. A very simple one is the, is the widow and the two mites, right? Uh, Christ saw a bunch of people putting money in the treasury. This woman, oh, by the way, for reference, if you want to know what two mites actually costs, if you adjust for inflation, today two mites would cost between one and two dollars. So a very small amount of money. Um, but Christ, even though, even though the money was pretty small, um, and keep in mind, you can still buy things with a dollar or two, right? You can buy bread, you can buy things at the dollar store, right? Um, so back then, you, she, she could have done, it's not like, it's not like pennies, right? It's, it's worth something. She could have bought food, right? And she was a widow. Um, so keep that in mind. <clears throat> Even though her, the actual amount of money was small, she was still praised for it. In the parable of the talents, uh, one person had five talents, one person had two, and, and they basically invested and made more. The person at the end who only had one, he wasn't condemned because he had one, but he was condemned because he didn't do anything with it, right? So even if we have a small amount of something, we should still um, put it to use. In the Good Samaritan, he, we don't really know what he had, but we knew the Samaritans weren't looked at as, as nice people. But all the Jews passed this man by, and, and the Samaritan was the only one who, who used this time and actually helped this man. In the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000, we know the boy didn't have much. He just had five loaves and two fish, but he even offered what he had, right? And an amazing miracle happened, right? So again, the idea that God can use whatever we have to give. We know that Zacchaeus gave um, money after he was transformed. So that's another thing. And not all of us are gonna be always in times of need. We're also gonna have times of prosperity. And so an example of this would be Joseph. We know that Joseph had a very long time of trial and tribulation, but all the way at the end, we know that because of his wisdom, because of his faith, when he was set as ruler in Egypt, they were able to save a lot of grain. And this was good for Egypt, but it was also good for his family, right? His family came back and they, there was a famine in his land where he came from. And he didn't end up saying, no, you guys betrayed me. You, you sold me to slavery. I'm just going to, you guys can all die and I'm going to stay here in Egypt. No, he, he forgave them and he helped them. So again, the idea that even though Joseph had kind of humble beginnings, when prosperity came, he didn't forget. I don't want to say he didn't forget where he came from, but he was able to forgive and, and give back to his family. So I hope that's a lot of supporting inf evidences to show you that um, whatever you can give is not insignificant. Now, I'm just gonna, for the last couple of minutes, I wanna go through a case study. One person um, in the Bible who, who I recently read about, and you know, a lot of us, I'm sure, have read Genesis many times in January when we're trying to get through the Bible and then we give up. Um, so we probably read uh, the story of Rebecca a few times, but I don't think I've ever heard a sermon or a, or a Bible study or anything that actually spoke about Rebecca's virtues. Um, that being said, I'm not making this stuff up. I got it from a few of the homilies of St. John Chrysostom. Um, and what he says about, about Rebecca and her story is actually very interesting. So um, if you don't take anything else 
from this talk take the idea that a person can be virtuous even if they're not famous, right? Even if we don't know about them. And I'm not talking about famous even in the world. I'm talking about famous biblically. I don't think Rebecca is a top 10 name that comes to anyone's mind when we think about Bible characters, right? But we'll see the kind of impact she actually had. So I know the, the story might be a little distant for some of us, so I want to just uh, go through it really quickly. Not the whole chapter, but just a few verses. So can I have someone read the first, these first uh, five verses? I'll do it. And it happened before he had finished speaking that behold, Rebekah, who was born to the soul, son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, came out with her pitcher on her shoulder. Now the young woman was very beautiful to behold, a virgin. No man had known her. And she went down to the well, filled her pitcher, and came up. And the servant, servant ran to meet her and said, Please let me drink a little water from your pitcher. So she said, Drink, my lord. Then she quickly let her pitcher down to her hand and gave him a drink. And when she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I will draw water for your camels too until they have finished drinking. Then she quickly emptied her pitcher into the trough, ran back to the well to draw water and drew for all his camels. Can I just have you just finish it up? So it was when the camels had finished drinking that the man said, Whose daughter are you? Tell me, please, is there room in your father's house for us to lodge? So she said to him, I am the daughter of the fool, Milka's son, whom she bore to Nahor. Moreover, she said to him, We have both straw and feed enough and room to lodge. So on face value, oh, and just for context, the man that's speaking to her is uh, Abraham's servant. Abraham was searching for a bride for Isaac, right? So Abraham sent his servant away, and the servant basically prays to God. Um, and this is the response. He, he meets Rebecca. And nothing really miraculous happened if you're, if you're looking at the story, right, and you're reading it. Like, okay, the man was thirsty. Rebecca offered him a drink. Um, he asked to stay somewhere. She responded saying, yeah, we have room. But if you actually dissect the story a little bit, you actually learn a lot. So the first thing is that Rebecca was completely willing to help the man. One second, because the Zoom is blocking my view. Okay, so the verse where it says the servant ran to meet her uh, and asked her to please give him a drink, right? And she said, drink my Lord. So he's a stranger, right? And, and we know pretty much back in ancient times, it wasn't necessarily customary for, for any person, any female to speak to any male on the street especially if they're strangers, right? So she didn't necessarily have an obligation to help this man out. Um, but the keyword here is quickly. So it's not like, it's not like she was saying, oh, fine, this person comes to me like, oh, I, I don't want them to say anything bad about me, so fine, I'll just give them water. No, she, she quickly did it, right? She saw a person in need and quickly helped them. So like I said, the servant's a stranger, and she did not... She could have easily maybe ignored him or, or ran away or did something else, but she didn't avoid this man at all. She quickly responded to his needs. And uh, St. John Chrysostom says that her virtue, her willingness to help and her generosity, um, is not only in what she did, but in her willingness in doing it. So when you think about it, like giving someone some water doesn't necessarily seem like this miraculous and very important thing, but in addition to her generosity, her willingness adds to her virtue. So she did this very uh, good thing for someone, even though it was a, he was a stranger. The next point is, it wasn't just left there. She actually kind of went the extra mile. So after she gave the servant the drink, we see that she also drew water for the camels, right? The servant didn't ask for this, um, but she offered to do it anyways. And again, she, she did it quickly and she was running while doing it, right? So again, running for a stranger, doing things quickly for a stranger, um, going the extra mile, putting more effort, right? So we see, we sort of see where her heart is and what, how she's dealing with this, with this stranger. And again, at this point, she doesn't know that this man is looking for, she didn't know about Abraham, she didn't know about Isaac, right? She's just helping a stranger out. Um, so again, she, she was eager to help the servant and she didn't delay, right? She didn't say, she didn't waste time. She didn't say like, okay, I helped you. I'm just going to go on my way now. Uh, no, she, she wanted to make sure that uh, the man was taken care of. And again, St. John Chrysostom says 
if what she gave, even though what she gave was only water, it's what she had in her power at the time, right? So she just had the water pot. So she did with him what she could and helped the person. And he says that we judge generosity not by the value of the gift, but by the resources of the gift. So this goes back to the example um, of the widow and the two mites, right? That's all she had and that's all she gave. Um, so we judge the generosity and the willingness to help by, by what the person has in their power at the time. So we talked about Rebecca's willingness to help the stranger, and we also talked about going the extra mile. The third and last thing about the story is that she went above and beyond. The, the servant asks her, do you have room for us to lodge? Once again, this man's a stranger. She said, not only do we have enough space for you to lodge and stay the night, but we can also feed your, fam uh, your, your camels, right? Um, so even though the servant only asked for, for one thing, she gave him what he wanted and she also offered food for the servant's camels. So once again, about this point, St. John Chrysostom says uh, uh, something very relatable, actually. Uh, we often get annoyed at entertaining acquaintances and friends. If they stay a day or two, we feel burdened. She drew a complete stranger into her house with great eagerness. Um, you know, I'm sure everyone at that point has had to, I don't know, you have family from Egypt or you have family from somewhere and they're staying at your house. They're like, oh, how long are these people going to stay, right? Um, I have to wake up in the morning, say hi, bring them food, bring them shade. <laughs> you know, we get annoyed. Um, actually, this is going to be a side note, but St. John Chrysostom, being a church father, he speaks with very relatable to us, right? He's not, he's not speaking heavy theology. He's, he's very relatable and, and was much, is very much a man of the, a saint of the people and a leader. Um, but that's a, besides the point. The point is here that Rebecca, even though it was a stranger, she went above and beyond for this person. So uh, my take home from just mentioning these things about Rebecca is even though she's not very well known in the grand scheme of things, when, when you think about biblical characters, she, she, it's quite remarkable what she can actually teach us, right? <clears throat> so what can we do today? I just have a few ideas, and I'm sure there's so many more. I'd love to hear what everyone has to say. Um, and this extends both, it's both valid now, but it's also valid for after this ends, right? We should always be checking up on others and seeing how they're doing. Um, of course, helping your family and friends is something that comes without saying, but especially in this time, if your family, if you can do something for your family, um, do it, right? I know a lot of people are, are like letting their, their parents stay home while they, while they buy things for them or, or doing more chores around the house or you know, doing things that their parents have been putting off and helping them with that. So whatever it is, um, do that. Um, when it comes to dealing with each other, uh, there's a lot of talk about being lean and compassionate with other people. And this actually came up, this is coming up a lot in, in if you're a teacher, um, it's coming up a lot in like pedagogical talks. They're saying students are going through a lot. We don't know what the students are going through. We don't know how their homes are being right. They were dislocated. Uh, if they were living in dorms, they went back. If you're in college, you went back either home or somewhere else. So basically the rule of thumb now that a lot of educators are getting is be lenient and compassionate with your students. This should also carry forward with us in dealing with other people, right? We shouldn't be having thoughts of, you know, oh man, my friend didn't get back to me. I texted them like five hours ago. Like, oh man, I texted my, 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 family, a different state, they haven't called me back, right? How come these people haven't called me? How come um, they're liking this person's post? Like, ignore that now, right? All this stuff is very small compared to um, the way we can be dealing with each other. And related to that, someone gave me a pretty good piece of advice lately, which was give people the benefit of the doubt, right? If, if you were expecting someone to do something or say something and they haven't, or if you were promised something, give them the benefit of the doubt, especially in this time. And it's always a good practice to give someone the benefit of the doubt because, again, you don't have all the facts, right? We don't know exactly what someone's going through. We don't know the entire big story. So it's always helpful to, to be gentle with other people. In addition to being kind and compassionate, don't jump to conclusions and, and just give them benefit of the doubt saying, okay, I don't have all the facts. So, you know, if, it's, if someone promises you something, maybe I'll reach out to them first or, or maybe 
if, if someone missed a deadline for something, extend it, whatever it is, right? And the, going back to Matthew 25, the, the moral of the story is help someone, right? Whatever that means to you. Your contribution is not insignificant. We looked at a bunch of examples. Even if your name is not going to be remembered on this earth, at least, we're not doing things to be remembered by people, right? We're doing things because we know it's the right thing and because we know God sees everything, even what you do in secret. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll leave it open to discussion if what else everyone else feels that they can do today and what you can do moving forward. Can we put this last slide, please, on the WhatsApp group? Yeah. Sure. We can expand this list if anyone has anything. Something you personally maybe went through or something someone did for you that you thought was very, very nice. Good idea. Good idea. Can we add smile? <laughs> Can add smile for sure. Anybody okay. got anybody got uh, got a thought? Anything going through anybody's um, head? I think this reminds me of one of my favorite Mother Teresa uh, quotes, which is "Do small things with great love." Um, and I think that's very much applicable. Like I try to apply that a lot to my job, which you all know is teaching. Lucky me. Um, and I do that because. I had a very good English teacher um, my senior year of high school who I was going through kind of a rough time and I walked in and it was my favorite class. And I was like, oh, hey, uh, how's it going? I didn't do any of the work that you assigned me. Okay, goodbye. And I went and sat down and uh, my teacher, instead of like giving me zero, which I full, full heartedly definitely deserved, um, didn't say anything, walked to the back of the classroom and put a piece of chocolate on my desk and then walked away. And I think that moment Again, it's a small moment, and he didn't remember it for like six years until I reminded him. Um, it's something that I hold dearly because it's a small thing, and it meant basically nothing to him, but it meant the world to me. So, yeah, for sure, something that something that you know your teacher is the one who did the act of kindness, right? And and something that's so easy to do can have such such a large impact on someone else while not taking too much away from us, right? It's not like every time we give something, we're sacrificing a huge chunk of our lives, right? It could be something so simple, but it could have such a strong, like a big impact on someone else's life. And not to mention it can help them pay it forward, right? So now you're a teacher, um, so you're taking that experience and, and you might be um, applying it to your, to your profession and helping other people as well. So that's great. I think encouraging each other because like right now some days like I wake up and I'm like Ugh, I don't want to do anything um so it's nice I remember on Casimir is always like be accountable have someone just have like a buddy system whether it's um uh, reading a chapter or even working out or whatever it is um but to just like encourage each other especially like on days where it just feels like Ugh. Yeah, for sure. I just, something I, I, I just share uh, my personal experience with you guys last week. On Monday, when people came uh, for my birthday, you don't know the feeling. It's, it's really, I cannot even express it. Just to see people who care to get out of their homes, they come just for five minutes people came from Long Island and just to say happy birthday and say hi from far for like five ten minutes. I think an old guy who you think that the things don't affect him, I'm telling you, and a kind love affects anyone. Anyone, regardless of age, regardless of position, regardless of uh, uh regardless of whatever. Any kind of action will affect tremendously in a positive way anyone. 100%. Um, 
I'll, get, I'll share another example um, that happened to me. Last week I was on a call um, with the director of the program that I, essentially my boss, but he's, he's more than that. He's a director of the entire program at the college I work in. And we were on a Zoom conference and one of the people in the call, uh, she has a kid who's maybe three years old and the kid was sort of like making noise. Um, and so she muted herself, but then the kid actually got in the frame it was like waving a toy in the in the screen. So the director could have easily been like, oh, what is this, such a big distraction? But he actually made the woman like unmute her thing and was like, he was talking to the kid for like a good three minutes, right? And everyone else on the call, like no one was like, oh, this is such a waste of time. Like, oh, what are we doing here? Everyone was like, oh, this is a good moment. Like the child feels acknowledged. And, and, and even though the child maybe is somewhat aware that the mom is doing work, um, the child wasn't like neglecting in that time. So something so small that could have such a big, such a big effect on someone without knowing, without knowing what that actually means to either the mom or what it means to the kid. So keep that in mind um, as you do your day-to-day -day operations, especially now, even, oops, even though everything's remote, you can still have a pretty profound impact on someone. Yeah. I think, I think, uh, you know, the, your last list um, of what we can do now, um, you know, I think it's really spot on, but I think ultimately, you know, getting outside of ourselves and uh, just thinking about other people outside of the people that are in your house and that you can hear um, or yourself is, is maybe where we get started, where um, you can only do all the things you mentioned here um, when you're not really concerned about your, your own specific needs um, all the time. I'll elaborate on what you were saying, thinking about others, I'll say praying for others. Actually. There. And I'll, I'll add some of the other things we said. Um, to this list as well and I'll, I'll post it because I liked, I definitely liked uh, where this conversation was going. Um, it's very helpful to also, like, like just to reiterate, um, it's helpful to think about things like Mary was sharing about when she was in school and high school. Um, think about things that were impactful for you and why they were impactful. You can use that as motivation and, and sort of pay it forward and treat someone else that way because you know how much it personally meant to you uh, you can do it to someone else or for someone else. 